We have said goodbye once again to the greatest week in the flat calendar. The racing is all over. The talking most definitely is not. And the man we talked about most last week was Frankie de Tori. We were not the only ones doing that. John Gosden was openly critical of the world's most famous jockey, his jockey, following Stradivarius's controversial defeat in the Gold Cup. Was that all heat of the moment stuff? Was there more to it? And following the fantastic victory of Inspiral in Friday's Coronation Stakes, has it all blown over? Inspiral is, of course, far from the only high-class three-roll filly in the care of John and Thady Gosden. They've also got Emily Upjohn and Nashua on whose back Holly Doyle on Sunday at Chanty became the first female jockey ever to win a European Group 1 Classic. That is something worth talking about and something worth celebrating. We had all hoped to celebrate seeing the Queen at some point during Royal Ascot. Sadly, that proved not to be possible. Her Majesty stayed away and she wasn't the only one. In a big week for Godolphin, Sheikh Mohammed was a very noticeable absentee. Even former dual champion jockey Paul Hannigan had only a single ride at the Royal meeting. He made that count, winning on 50 to one shot the Riddler. But should his shock success now prove the final straw in racing's dangerous riding debate. Well, joining me, Lee Mottiser, to talk about the big stories this week are my Racing Post colleagues, Maddie Playle and Jonathan Harding. And Jonathan, you've not done this before, so why not get rolling straight away and tell us why Frankie should be voted our front page story of the week. Absolutely, well, Frankie Vittori is no stranger to making headlines during Royal Ascot, and he was all anybody was talking about last week. He had a roller coaster time of it, uh, a meeting he's made his own through the years. His, w the beginning of the week could hardly have been any worse. It was like something out of a Netflix drama. It was just awful. He struggled to pull the hood off Lord North in the stalls, blew the race there. He then got a fairly public uh, telling off uh, relating to his ride on Stradivarius in the Gold Cup for dropping him in too far. He then nearly won with the Queen's Horse Saga, but missed out and again doubled down criticism from John Gosden, a joint trainer of that horse. And just as if it hadn't gone badly enough, Reach for the Moon was then a beaten odds on favourite uh, for the Queen again. So the world's most famous jockey had an, a week to forget, but he turned it round then with victory on in Spiral, which could hardly have been any more impressive. So it's the, a huge story really because we're talking about racing's biggest name and you would think we, was, we were trying to retire him after his couple of bad days. A few people saying, Is, has he still got it? Has he still got that spark? Will, he, will John Gosden persevere? What's their relationship like? Sort of guessing at that, because it was very unlike John Gosden to be so critical of a jockey that's given him so much. So that's why it's such a huge story, because he, he is the, he's the man, really. And to see him bounce back like that suggests to me anyway that he's still got enormous uh, ability. He's not done just yet, but the way people were talking, there are a few question marks. It's a very strange day, um, Thursday. I think we're all watching from the stands or on TV. You came away from the stands and you thought, has he messed up there on Stradivarius? You know, it didn't look bad. That, that visual image of Stradivarius's head at 45 degrees when Frankie sort of pulled him out, yanked him out to challenge, didn't look great. And then we got down to the winner's enclosure and it was a very odd one because obviously the Ascot winner's enclosure, I should say that it's more of the parade room bit because the winner goes into the winner's circle, but the, that bit where the, the place horses dismount, the connections know that they're surrounded by journalists and that journalists hear things. And the first thing that John Gosden said, is there a reason why you took him back so far? John must have known that everyone would hear him say that. And he repeated it on ITV, his, his criticism of the ride beyond Nielsen, the owner was extremely obvious in what he was saying that he said it, it wasn't the horse's fault uh, why he, he got beat and that all sort of rolled on we had scenes in the weighing room where you could see Frankie's arms waving as he spoke to John Gosden it was very strange um, and then on Friday yes as you say in Spiral was successful in the coronation stakes but John again was still very prepared to say that he thought Saga should have won the Britannia and that Frankie had overcomplicated things on Stradivarius and it is of interest because you know, Frankie is a confidence jockey. We all know that Frankie thrives when Frankie's world is going great and he's riding winners. And it can't have been easy to be criticised by your trainer. Um, 
I, I, I did think it was a, a fascinating series of events. Um, I think two of the things that I, I took from it, one was speaking to people around that setup. There was, I thought, clear a, a clear sense that maybe this wasn't a a one-off incident and that things may be, there were, there were bigger issues at play. Of course, he said Emily Upjohn had a very controversial defeat in the Oaks just a uh, few days earlier. Um, so I wonder what will go on from here over the coming weeks. But I would just say as well that watching, again, from third level of the grandstand on Friday, when in spiral swept through in the coronation stakes and she galloped past us with the race pretty much already won, by far and away, the biggest noise of the week came across those grandstands. By far and away, the biggest noise of the week. And that wasn't, I think, just because Inspire was a well-backed favourite, but because Frankie de Tori, for the people who were there, and for the majority of probably casual flat racing fans anyway, he is still the one. And as putting the piece in the post, he's probably the only one, the one that they really recognise. Now, maybe that will change in time when we talk about Holly Doll and other people like that, but Frankie's mm -hmm. celebrity is still greater than anybody else in flat racing. He will have been buoyed by that, but equally, I'm not sure you can necessarily forget that quickly, that public dressing down from your boss. What was your take on Yeah, a couple of things. Um, one of the things I took out of it was when Frankie spoke to the press after Stradivarius' defeat, and he sort of said, oh, well, you know, he had time to go by and yeah. the younger legs were quicker. I thought that was quite quite telling. He didn't, he didn't want to sort of admit that he'd made a mistake when a lot of people were suggesting he had done so. And, of course, similar um, to the previous year's Gold Cup where he couldn't quite get a run and things developed away from him. Um, and the other thing is, we, we talk about uh, John Gosden and Bjorn Nielsen and their reaction and um, this sort of public uh, hanging out to dry, if you like. In contrast, William Haggis um, with Kieran Fallon uh, after the St James's Palace stakes, where of course he was blocked on the inside aboard Mao Zoom, who stayed on really eye-catchingly in the final furlong. He sort of came out and defended him immediately. Um, so that contrast of... Mm. Admittedly, Dottori is a more senior figure and, and Kieran Fallon's still a jockey who's, who's earning his stripes, yeah. so to speak. But I thought that was very sporting of William to come out and say, look, he's a young jockey. It was a big opportunity for him. He's made a mistake. It happens. Um, whereas that was definitely not what was going on in the Dottori camp. Personally, I, I think maybe because it is his meeting, we're so used to him dominating at it. It's easy to, to over egg this one. Um, I wouldn't be in a hurry to say Dottori's done for or anything like that. He made a few mistakes. Um, it happens. And I think as well, given Ryan Moore rode so beautifully all week, he was really on a charge. It sort of makes it even more emphasised what a, what a bad week Dottori had. Lord North, I don't think you could say is necessarily his fault. It's I think that's just it. one of those instances, yeah. And even, I, I, you know, the stall handlers surely would, would be tucking the, the hood onto the horse. So perhaps they have a role to play in this rather yeah, than Dottori being yeah. unable to pull it off. Um, I, I don't think that's fair. Um, Saga, you know, it's a big field handicap. It, you're not going to get the rub of the green all the time. They're going to be hard luck stories. Um, I'm not saying he, he, he rode at his best and he is clearly a confidence jockey, but I do think we can get sort of sucked into this mm. um, narrative of him being done and dusted. But it is interesting, um, Lee, you party to... Um, some of these conversations going around, what his future is going to look like. And it's clearly not a very easy uh, relationship between the pair at the moment. So it makes for, for fascinating watching as an outsider. I suspect any major sporting relationship has those ebbs and flows in relationships. Yeah. You look at someone like Sir Alex Ferguson. There were, there were times where he would have been angry with his, mm -hmm. some of his players. Publicly. Like, yeah, absolutely. It, 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 that's, it's not, that, that's, that's unusual. It's not, and that's why I'm slightly torn on it, because the gut instinct is, oh, he's hung him out to dry there, that's not very nice, but we're always saying we want honesty, we want, mm. you know, Dottori's a big boy, he can take criticism, he's, he's, he's had the highs, he understands the lows, and he, the spotlight on Dottori is that much brighter than it would be on a young Kieran Fallon, because we expect so much from him. Yeah. Mm. The Gosdens and Connections expect so much from him because he's done so much right. He's an elite sportsman. You know, a footballer misses a penalty with a silly run-up and the manager comes out and goes, well, you, could, you should have done that differently. That was a bit silly. We don't bat an eyelid. So I'm not, I, I, I don't hate the fact that we got honesty from Connections, but it was the doubling down on a jockey we know relies on confidence that felt a little bit counterintuitive to me. You know, Dottori yeah. is an extrovert. 
And the reason he's been so successful is because he's so confident. Yeah. So to be sort of publicly, I think it should have been left on that day, to then sort of repeat it the following was a little bit odd to me, even after In Spiral. Was, it felt like there was something a little a deeper going on, but on the, the broader De Tory debate, I mean, he's, he is, like you say, he's still the man, bar the Queen, he's the one everybody wanted to see, and he's still a, a ridiculously good jockey. It wasn't that long ago, we were talking about, he's never gonna retire, he's banged in all those group ones, how is he riding so well? It's, just, it's a fickle game sometimes, and I just think, I think there was sort of a storm in a teacup, but like you say, there seems to be something going on. I don't think you can blame him for Reach for the Moon. I think that horse was given yeah. every chance. He just wasn't good enough um, on the day. I think you're right about that. And I, I just sort of uh, sum it up as well by saying that it's only, what, three months since he won the Dubai World Cup? Um, yeah, that, that seems like a lifetime ago, but it is Such a three fickle months. industry, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, but that's had, sport. It is. Know? That's Had sport. Emily up, John. One got up on the final stride to win the Oak. She was in front, maybe the, the, the stride before, the stride after. Had she got that bob, we'd have looked back on that very differently. Had Stradivarius mm. been two years younger and managed to get up in the Gold Cup, we might have looked back on, on that ride very differently. I think we should, we, we should be allowed to analyse and criticise, but in this instance, and I think sometimes maybe the media can be guilty of, of not doing that enough um, necessarily, but I think uh, in this instance, you know, because it played out by his trainer, it was made that little bit more personal. And as you say, he doubled down. It wasn't just a one comment mm -hmm. and then we'll move on. It, yeah. it, was, it was confirmed later on, if you like. And I think what it did remind us is that even though Frankie Dettori is, as we said, we keep saying, the world's most famous jockey, the one that everybody loves, the one who's recognised more than anybody else, the one who in November had a film premiere in London. You know, who else is going to have a film premiere in racing? Despite all that, when you look within Clarehaven, within John and Thady Gosden, because that's a different operation now, you've got two people running that business, they still are the boss. Frankie Dettori, however big he is, is an employee. And as all of us as employees, sometimes we get it wrong and sometimes we get told as much. So a week of ups and downs for Frankie Dettori. For somebody else, both here and in France, it was a week of only ups. Yeah, another fantastic week for Holly Doyle. Of course, she won the Coventry aboard Brad Sell for her boss Archie Watson on Tuesday. And then yesterday in France, she won the Prix de Dian aboard Nashua. Um, not the first female jockey to ride a classic winner. Sybil Vot uh, won last year's German 1000 guineas aboard November, but that was only a group two. Um, but as Jonathan, I think, is going to point out, it's interesting how we're going to talk about female rider first. So I'll let him do that in a moment. But let's just read out some of Holly Dawes' achievements, because I think that's important um, when we're talking about the context of her career. So um, last year, she partnered 172 winners in a calendar year. That's more than any female rider ever. She had Group 1 wins aboard Trushan in the 2021 Goodwood Cup. And before that, Glen Shield in the Champion Sprint in that wonderful photo finish. And I think this was... Doyle at her best um, aboard Nashua. She said it was plan F, uh, so things did not go to plan. Um, broke prominently, there was not a lot of pace as we often see in these French classics. She took initiative and uh, took her to the front. The filly was quite keen, quite lit up, but she managed to get her settled and then timed her run to perfection just to hold off um, the late charge at the end. I thought it was lovely to see Gerald Mosse shake her hand after the line as well. Some good sportsmanship there. And, we should see that more in Britain, I think. I really like that when, when jockeys congratulate each other and it's deserved very much so because um, Holly's done a, a fantastic job for many years now and it's not a surprise that she's winning classics at all. Um, recently, she did an interview in the Racing Post and she spoke about how she's acknowledging her position um, as a woman in this sport a little bit more than she once did. But obviously for her, it's all about doing the best that she can. Um, and that's what she did. But a big part of this success must go down to Imad al Sagar, who retains her um, since July 2020 was when that relationship was formed. And he sort of, she credits him for opening doors for her. And she said she wouldn't have got the ride on a Gosden trained horse without him. So that just shows how these connections are really important in this game. And as we often say, you need one big horse to have a breakthrough. We saw it with David Egan having Prince Basel um, and Mishrif, of course, that's a, a great relationship. And hopefully we'll see uh, those two back. And it was the first homebred uh, classic winner for Blue Diamond Stud. Um, so clearly a very important one. For me, I think one of the brilliant things about Holly 
is how good a role model she is. Um, and interestingly, you know, she's so self-deprecating. She, you know, always um, reflects the, the, the pleasure of, of riding these horses and she's never one to indulge herself really um, on her talents. But interestingly, uh, I was in a BHA appeal where she was appealing a two-day ban for careless riding. So that's going to link to something that we're going to talk about later on um, for a ride um, aboard Darbucks at Wolverhampton in April. And I really saw a different side of, of Holly there. And as much as she is this very calm, very measured, John Gosden saying she's a meticulous rider, she does have that inner steel. And I think that's really interesting to see um, for a jockey because that's not what we see in the post race. Um, and I wonder, in, in a week where Dottori has been so publicly lambasted, I thought it was very interesting how John Gosden was so positive about Holly saying that he recommended her to Imad Al Sagar when, uh, when he was coming calling to uh, retain a rider. Um, and as we're gonna talk about retaining riders, you know, you've got very set um, relationships in the weighing room these days. Obviously, Sean Levy's got a great relationship with Richard Hannum for one. David Egan rides a lot for Roger Varian. You've got um, Richard Fahey in the north has got a new stable jockey now as well. I wonder if potentially Holly Doyle could be the next number one rider at Clarehaven. It's certainly uh, a possibility. I mean, Frankie Dottori can only go on for so long, even if, even if we hadn't had last week's um, sort of mini bust up at, at, at Ascot. Yeah. You can only go on for, for so long. Every sports person has a, has a length of time that their, their career can last. And I think with Holly, it certainly is a, le a legitimate question to ask. I remember years ago, and this is many years ago now, um, it might have been when Johnny Murta left Bally Doyle or Jamie Spencer left, but something like that. We were doing um, uh, a, like a vignettes, pen portraits of people who might take that job. And we included, I think, Cathy Gannon at that point. Now, no disrespect to Cathy Gannon, but Cathy Gannon was never going to be realistically a contender for that job. But, but we, we, we wanted to have a female jockey in, in, in the list because we wanted it to look... Uh, open and diverse and possible but it was never going to happen realistically now if a big job becomes available Holly Doyle would absolutely be a legitimate contender for that job it's a mark of how far she's gone that when we approached the Oaks and the Prix de Diane this year um, there was never any doubt or discussion about would Holly Doyle be replaced on Nashua by somebody else because it does happen that young mm. retained jockeys sometimes do get replaced in big races. Wasn't even a discussion point. Not only was it not a discussion point among the connections, it wasn't a discussion point among the media. Yeah. You know, she just everyone would just assume that Holly Doyle would ride the horse. You know, Richard Kingscote referenced before the Derby that he wasn't banking on being able to ride. Desert Crown in the Derby. Although he'd ridden the horse in the Dante, he knew that he was of a, a standing, if you like, or he felt himself he was mm. of a standing in the weighing room, whereby if a superstar rider had become available, that he thought maybe he might be vulnerable. Now, Connections didn't think like that, but the fact that Richard thought like that is indicative of, I think, how a lot of jockeys would think in that sort of position, maybe in Holly's position, but not in the case of Holly Doll, not with the Connections, not with us. I think that is a mark of how far she's come and is a mark of how far she's come that, as you say, if any job becomes available now, she would be a player for that job. And it's also a mark of how far she's come that she has this retainer with Imad Al Sagar and it's clearly done great things for her and she's won a major European classic. But Imad Al Sagar, as an owner, he's not the very top table. He's not a Premier League owner. He has a few really good horses. But he's not Godolphin or Bally Doyle or, or Judmont. And at some point you might be thinking, if you're Holly Doyle, have you almost outgrown that job because you're so good? And these are all great things to be saying about a female jockey because, I mean, it's amazing how much has changed, hasn't it, in the last few mm. years. We've had Rachel Blackmore, now we've had Holly Doyle and others around the world, Michelle Payne winning Melbourne Cups. It's a fantastic thing to be able to talk about. And we say that, don't we, as well? We say sort of, she's not a great female jockey, she's just a great jockey. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and I'm keen for this not to be a, a you know, 
to keeping it too much down the, the gender route. Because as you say, lots of male jockeys are struggling and you know they need the big horse as much as, as lots of women do. I'm not, you know, I'm sure a lot of the women in the weighing room probably have more to overcome in many ways. I'm not saying it's a totally level playing field even now. Um, but Holly now, I think, has earned the position where we just talk about her as a great rider. Yeah, and it's an interesting thing that I think the racing press have to contend with here is that she is the first jockey to do to win the D Diane. She is the first jo female jockey to do X, Y, and Z. And there's a point where you have to celebrate that because it is breaking new ground. But with Doyle, it's almost gone so far that it, it almost takes away a little bit to say she's the first female. I know she takes that responsibility 100%. seriously, but she is one of the top five jockeys in Britain, to my mind. She is going on an enormously upward trajectory. And I know that she, having spoken to her, would like to be viewed as, well, I'm not a female jockey, I'm a jockey. And Rachel Blackmore saying exactly the same thing. There's a tightrope to be walked between celebrating what she's doing as a female jockey versus what she's doing as a jockey full stop. Her achievements are exceptional for any jockey. A lot of jockeys never ride a classic winner. She's just gone and done one. Yeah. And, I, and I would say it's fairly long, or short odds, sorry, that that there will be more to come from her in terms of classics, in terms of bigger jobs, because she is just, having spoken to her, it, the irony with her is for somebody who dislikes the headlines and spotlight, she always finds a way to get herself in them. You know, she's always doing these exceptional things and um, she's got the work ethic to go with it as well. And I think personality-wise, she's not a Frankie de Torres. She's not, dare I say, an, an Asheen Murphy and being very vocal, very out there. But not everyone needs to be, do they? Exactly right. And she's just single-mindedly focused on the job. And look, it's paying dividends. So a fascinating career to follow. And it is just great PR for sport as well. With the best one in the world, um, what happened yesterday would not have been reported on the BBC Sport website or app had any other jockey won that race. But Holly Doyle's victory was promoted, mm -hmm. was reported by the BBC. And whilst we, it is great now to be able to discuss Holly Doyle and Rachel Blackmore and others like that as just jockeys and not female jockeys, it remains the case that when they win a big race, they do get coverage for that reason. More coverage and they, they get coverage in place that might not otherwise get coverage. And that's not so much good for them because they don't need it, but it's great for horse racing. And I think my just overriding point is, um, this is just a great success story, isn't it? You've got a guy who's put a trust in a jockey, um, stayed loyal to her. It's a homebred horse, um, ran in, in the Oaks not even that long ago, and then has come back and won a classic. I just think it's fantastic, and um, I'm really looking forward to seeing how Holly's career develops, because at the moment there's only one way, and that's up. I might say the question now, though, is we have these flag bearers in Rachel Blackmore, Holly Doyle, but is that translating to female jockeys across the board at every level of the game? You know, we're talking about one of the finest jump jockeys in Blackmore, one of the finest flat jockeys in Holly Doyle. But is that filtering down in the sense that female jockeys are being given more opportunities at the lower end of the pyramid, other female jockeys? And is, are we going to have that ripple effect 10, 15 years down the line where there's going to be an influx of female jockeys who suddenly see these guys and think, I could do that. I'm, that's what I'm interested to see, whether it has that feeder effect down the line. OK, right, my turn now. And um, I am going to pick up the baton from Chris Cook, who last week spoke about dangerous riding, improper riding, in light of that BHA hearing at which Huey Morrison had been very um, vocal in his disappointment uh, about the ride that Ray Dawson gave a horse at York. And I spoke to Huey Morrison on the phone um, at Ascot on Wednesday, ringing him for a preview quote. He had a runner in the Hampton Court Stakes the following day. And um, we're having a bit of a chat beforehand, and Hugh was saying he thought it was very important that that subject of dangerous riding, uh, and I, I'm not talking literally here about the offence of dangerous riding, but dangerous riding in general, what people might perceive to be dangerous riding, he thought it was very important that that was maintained and that it wasn't a subject that was allowed to just be locked away in a cupboard. How interesting then that the very same, the very following, the following day, um, it's as if he knew. It's as if he knew. <laughs> we had the Norfolk Stakes and Paul Hannigan's winning ride on the Riddler, which understandably, inevitably, and quite rightly, received an awful lot of coverage. Now, as someone who is 
very fond of Paul Hannigan. I like Paul Hannigan very much indeed. And we had a good chat after the race about obviously his move, moving on from Richard Fahey's yard, who actually he won the race for. Um, and he was very uh, candid in his quotes about that. And that it was great to see Paul winning the race for that reason. But he did acknowledge that there was another side to that victory. And lots of people remarked on the fact that the Riddler wiped out, um, it's probably the, the phrase that was used quite, quite widely, um, three of his rivals in the Norfolk Stakes, two Ammo Racing horses and a horse ridden by James Doyle, trained by Michael Bell. And you can certainly argue that, that in the case of James Doyle, he was perhaps unlucky or lucky not to come down. Uh, Ammo Racing felt that they were very lucky not to win the race with, with, with Crispy Cat, who finished third. And they all pointed the finger at the actions of Paul Hannigan on the Riddler. The Riddler came across um, those rivals in the closing stages with Paul Hannigan using his whip in the right hand. The outcome was a 10-day careless riding suspension for Paul Hannigan. Paul Hannigan, uh, when we spoke afterwards, look at my screen now, he said, I definitely deserved a ban without a doubt. I did think 10 days was a bit harsh. I go around every day, see interference every day, and sometimes I wonder how a jockey hasn't picked up days. And it seems to me that that is at the nub of this issue. Paul Hannigan was doing something in that race that he believes on other race courses doesn't get punished. And that's probably now reflective of what a lot of jockeys think is that this now has become something that is permitted. Um, that win at all costs attitude, that the, the victory um, is so important that it's worth taking a suspension uh, for that success. It was roundly criticised, and that, that was by people who like Paul Hannigan very much indeed. And I think we probably need to look at the, the offence as opposed to the individual, because he's not the only individual that, that's done something like this. It was obviously important and significant that one of the people commenting on this was Freddie Talitsky on Sky Sports Racing. And we all know how his life was changed um, by... Uh, a mid-race incident at Kempton and Freddie said a ride like that shouldn't be happening. Ruby Walsh spoke about um, how he felt sympathy for the connections of a horse who had been fouled by the fowler. Mm -hmm. The BHA pointed out that those people saying that everywhere else in the world this horse would have been disqualified, they're actually wrong because the rest of the world has in general moved to the BHA's position on interference in races and what happens. But I think we are left with a situation whereby I think there are two distinct debates. One is, is it right that that horse kept the race? Yes, he was almost certainly the best horse in the race on the day. I think that was probably majority opinion. He was the best horse in the race on the day, but he materially impacted the chance of Crispy Cat from finishing one place better than he did. They were, they were upset by that. At the same time, you actually wind back 34 years and you had a horse called Royal Gate, won the Gold Cup, Cash as Moosin uh, on, on Royal Gate's back, uh, executed a manoeuvre that the stewards didn't like, jeopardised another horse's safety, jockey came off and that horse was disqualified having won the Gold Cup by five lengths. We're now in a situation whereby there was a fury then saying, how can you disqualify Royal Gate? We're now saying, how can you not disqualify the Riddler? So it's a complicated one. Mm. And I think with that sort of, uh, that sort of conversation, you're never going to please everybody in terms of whether your horse keeps the race or doesn't keep the race. But the, the other debate as well is, for all that Paul Hannigan got 10 days, was that careless riding? There's careless riding, there's improper riding, there's dangerous riding. The, uh, the offence of improper riding kicks in if a rider causes interference by some manoeuvre where he knew or ought reasonably to have known that the interference would be the result. And although Paul defended his ride, and said he put the, the stick down. At that point, that was after the horses had been interfered with. Was that, was that careless or was it more than careless? To my eyes, even being someone who is a huge Paul fan, I'd like to see him win the race, it felt more than careless to me. And I walked away from the race with, with doubts that others have expressed as well. What do you think, John? Well, I think um, British racing has a wonderful propensity for shooting itself in the foot and when it comes to interference, there is a complete lack of transparency. There will be people watching that race, let alone the people who own the horses that were affected, people who had a bet on that race, thinking, what on earth, what's the punishment? What on earth does a jockey have to do to 
cause their horse to get disqualified. It's necessarily subjective, but we essentially have a rule beyond careless riding that people are, are afraid to use because of the potential ramifications of that. So why do we have it in the first place? I think they need to look at the entire penalty system because at the moment it's, it's not effective. It's completely blunt because you've got jockeys who are winning races and then worrying about the consequences after. And from a safety point of view, that is an enormous red flag. If, if let's say, heaven forbid, something happened in that race and the jockey came off the third and was badly injured, what do we say then? You know, I, for me, for me, there's no point having rules that we're afraid to use and, and put into place. And something has to happen to deter jockeys from just allowing this to happen and going, well, you know, it happens everywhere else, so it's absolutely fine here. I still won the race and 10 days is just a holiday. You know, it ha it's serious. It's serious stakes here. And just because something bad didn't happen doesn't mean it won't down the line. Yeah, I totally agree with everything that's been said. And I think as well, Chris um, made some brilliant points last week that are still relevant now around this, this word dangerous and, and why perhaps, it, you know, people are afraid to use it and why that's just not functional anymore. Um, you can't have an environment where incidents like this are, are commonplace. And clearly Paul Hannigan thinks that it does happen a lot. This was on the biggest stage, so it was getting a big audience. Um, but I think it's just the latest reminder and a catalogue of issues how our rules need to be adapted, I think. Yeah, I think, I think, I think that's right. I think it's probably now, I would hope, it's now very hard for the BHA not to, not to look at this because I think there is a groundswell of opinion that the status quo, where it's reached, isn't satisfactory and that things are taking place on race courses that aren't just being criticised by people like us, by journalists who have never had any direct involvement in riding racehorses, but by people who have ridden racehorses, people like Ruby Walsh, people like Freddie Tillitsky, who say that what is happening on the tracks isn't acceptable. And for as long as jockeys believe that it is highly unlikely that they will be disqualified, and remember, um, Da di uh, dangerous riding offences automatically trigger disqualification. A rider who is found guilty of the dangerous riding, that the horse has to be thrown out. But that hasn't happened for 13 years. So if you believe in a race that you are going so well on your horse that you can barge your way out in a way that you think, mm, it's, it, it, the stewards would have to be pretty darn confident to do me for dangerous riding when they haven't done it for 13 years. If you think you can get away with it and you're going to win by so far that the stewards can't make the case that you have improved your own position or that you weren't the best horse in the race, you know, that, that, that you have improved your position material relative to other people, um, then I think jockeys will, will probably carry on doing that. For all that there is always debate, always, always a, a, a view that riders want harsher rules, what happens on the track is is key and I think it'd be very hard now for the BHA not to at least look at this and I think I look at the stewards report that came out on on Thursday I remember that the BHA's head of stewarding Sean Parker was was officiating that day and they said taking into account that Crispy Cat could have in the stewards opinion finished in second place and the degree of risk for Doyle James Doyle as a result of interference Halligan was suspended for 10 days 10 days is a lot of days, fair enough, but many people would say it could be, should be more days, and they would also say, I think, that careless riding, the bottom tier of possible interference offences, just doesn't seem right for that particular crime. What do we think the answer is here? Because I suggested uh, on social media, maybe, you know, is it just making bans more severe to act as a deterrent? And Mick Fitzgerald, again, another person who has ridden and knows um, the regulations, knows what is and isn't acceptable and has been in that position said well it's always not going to be enough unless other members are involved i.e the, the owners or you know if it's to do with the horse achieving a particular result for, for racing yeah. purposes for bloodstock purposes and it, it made me rethink it a little bit and it's you know at the moment as as ruby walsh said um our rules favor the horse who um the fowler not the person mm. who was fouled um and I wonder how, how do we think um, this should be tackled? Is it as simple as giving jockeys harsher bans? Or is this, but then do you, you know, do you punish, um, 
you know, if we're talking about the Riddler incident specifically, you know, that horse was clearly the best, I'd argue. So are you therefore punishing people who have backed that horse if you throw him out? How does it, how do we achieve this balance, do you think? Well, it's difficult because the, the ride given to a horse and the punish, the according punishment seems to be so related to how well that horse is going and where they finish when really should that when it be, comes to safety should that mm. be relevant yeah. if a jockey on the best horse in the race is going really well and rides improperly they should be punished and that should be from a sporting point of view integrity is everything and if you're you feel kind of looking behind and thinking well they won and it probably was the best horse in the race but they've ultimately sort of cheated and they've done something bad and from a safety perspective, dangerous, they should be demoted or disqualified. But then you get into the realms of, well, the jockey's making a split second decision. Should we punish the connections who had the best horse? Should we punish a trainer that had the best horse? I think probably that would be, it would certainly act as a deterrent if you, if the horse wins is the best horse in the race, but because there's a foul play's gone on, gets disqualified for that it would work but whether that would be too extreme i don't know that's well, the debate yeah the way i'd sum it up is i think at the moment i'd think three things i think one is stewards need to be uh, more prepared to look beyond careless riding whether that's improper riding or dangerous riding i think the wording of the rules needs re-examining and i think thirdly the status quo just can't remain so at this point, we then have to decide uh, what should be our front page story of the week. And regrettably, it, it falls to me as uh, your, 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 your mighty leader for this discussion. And I think whilst the, 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 the big personal stories there surrounding Frankie Dottori and Holly Doyle um, were, were really huge stories in the sport last week because of the potential ramifications of the whole um, riding debate and what's taking place on race courses um, I think that dangerous riding improper riding careless riding uh, debate and whether we throw horses out or not and whether we give riders more severe penalties that probably should be the front page story and I'm not saying that just because I proposed it although I did propose it that then is the end of this week's edition of the front page thank you to Maddie thank you to Jonathan thank you to you for watching and we shall return next week. Until then, goodbye.